Okay, so let us look at the normal distribution again, but this time we are going to look at some of the functions in R that allow us to ask interesting and useful questions about this particular example of a continuous random variable. So, what we have seen so far, I am just reminding you what we have done so far. We can figure out, in theory at least, right, we can figure out the area under the curve between a particular range of values in the normal distribution, and that gives us the probability of observing those particular range of values, right. So, that is what we need the CDF for. And uh, I told you earlier that we have got two parts to the probability density function associated with the normal, the normalizing constant, and the kernel, right. And we can work out the normalizing constant once we have a kernel. The relevance of this will, of course, become clear later, but I just want you to understand that there are always these two parts, and one of them is a constant, right, that you can figure out, at least in easy cases, right. Okay, so let us look at some of the functions that are available in R that allow us to use the normal distribution in various ways that is really, really helpful when doing statistical modeling, okay. So, if you remember in the Bernoulli case, for example, we had these functions, the R band, D band, P band, and Q band functions, right. So, if you have forgotten what these are, go back and review the material so that you are clear on what these functions do. Because what we are going to do now is that we are going to use this DPQR family of functions in the continuous space, okay. And of course, there are important differences now between the discrete and the continuous case as I will show you. First of all, you can generate random data from a normal distribution using the R norm function, right. So, there is an example here. I am generating five data points, randomly generated data points from the standard normal, just as an example, okay. I could have chosen any value for mu for the mean and for the standard deviation and I would get appropriate, you know, samples from that particular distribution. And of course, if I ran this command multiple times, I would get different numbers each time. Now, I also want to point out that in R, the default values for the mean and standard deviation are 0 and 1 respectively. So, I could have actually dropped that. If I want to generate data from a standard normal, I can just drop the mean and standard deviation specification because that is the default value anyway. Right, so I'm getting different numbers, of course, but um, that's because I'm generating new random data each time. Okay, this tool is extremely important for us in statistical modeling when we want to understand the properties of an experiment design. We'll be understanding those properties by randomly generating new data from a particular statistical model to understand the properties of that model. That's why this function is so crucial in our training as statisticians, okay. All right. So, the next example I want to show you uh, is the use of the p norm function. This is of course, the cumulative distribution function of the normal distribution. And here I can ask questions like, what is the probability of observing a value like 2 or something less than that, right? That I could write like this. And then the, I would compute that with p norm 2. So, this gives me the probability of observing 2 or something less than that. Incidentally, I could have just written what is the probability of observing some value like 2, exactly 2 or something less than that. Here, I have written strictly less than 2. But they will give you the same probabilities. Why? Because the probability of exactly getting 2 is 0. Right. So, sometimes in textbooks, you might see this written as with, uh, written with a less than or equal sign, but that is just the same thing, right. It is not going to change anything. So, that is my cumulative probability of 2 or less than 2. And um, I could even ask a question like, what is the probability of observing a value like 2 or something larger than 2, right. And to do that, there is a function inside, there is a specification inside this p norm function which says lower dot tail equal to false. What that is saying is that do not look to the left of 2 in the distribution, rather look to the right of 2, right. So, the lower tail equal to false means that you look at the probability to the right of the number that you are talking about, right. So, that is what this useful functionality is in all the DPQR functions. It is there I think in every function. Okay. So, this is the useful, you know, uh, way that you can compute probabilities for particular values. And you can see how you might compute the probability of observing a value between 2 and minus 2, right. You calculate the cumulative probability of 2 or less than 2. That covers the entire area 
to the left of 2. And you subtract from that the probability of observing minus 2 or something less than 2. So it would be a subtraction. So these are exercises that you will do later on to get a handle on how this p norm function or this p family of functions works. All right, and uh, another important function is the Q norm function, which is the inverse of the CDU. So you can ask questions like, what is the quantile Q such that the area under the curve to the left of it is 0 0.977, right? And what this Q norm function does is it gives you that quantile. In that case, in this case, it's actually two. That's exactly what I did here. I plugged in two, I got this, where was it? Sorry, I plugged in 2 and I got a probability 0.977. Now I'm plugging in into the Q norm function this probability and getting back 2, right? Well, it's approximately 2, okay? Right. So these are very important functions that allow you to ask useful questions about a particular distribution that you're working with. Right? That's why I'm talking about these at such length because they are very, very useful for understanding uh, different uh, aspects of a distribution. These are the questions you can ask from a distribution. And so finally, I come to the most important thing that I want to talk about in the normal distribution, which is the d-norm function, right? So if you remember, in the d-band function and the d-binom function, we actually got the probability of a particular outcome in those discrete random variable cases, right? In, as I told you before several times now, in the continuous case, you cannot ask or you can, of course, but you, the probability of getting a particular point value is always zero, right? So the d norm function, unlike the d band and d binom functions, does not give you the probability of a particular outcome, but it does give you a non-zero number. What is that number? That number is the density of that particular value. And what that really means is that it's telling you the result of computing that function, right? You plug into the normal density function, you plug in a particular number like two, right? That's what I'm doing here. This is f of x here, by the way, right? This d norm function is that probability density function, f of x, and it's returning the y value, right? The y axis value, right? For that particular number. And that value is the density of the normal distribution. It is not the probability. Please keep this very clear in your minds that when we're talking about continuous random variables, we are talking about the density of a particular point. We are not talking about the probability because the probability is always zero, right? Okay. <clears throat> so this is just a summary to remind you of all the functionality that's available for a continuous random variable, in this case, the normal, right? You can generate ron random data. This is just random data on the x-axis that I just produced. If I re-ran this command, it would give me different data. Close, right? I get different numbers each time. I can compute the area under the curve between, let's say, plus one and minus one, right? And that would give me this area under the curve using this p-norm function, right? I, I'm subtracting minus one, the cumulative probability of minus one or less than that from the cumulative probability of one or something less than that, and I get this area under the curve. This is a very useful function of great practical significance to us later on, right? The d-norm function for a given value on the x-axis is going to tell me the point on the curve, right? The y-value of the probability density function. And this value here is non-zero, of course, but it's a density. It's not a probability, okay? And the q-norm function gives you for any given probability, it tells you what the quantile is such that the area under the curve to the left of that quantile is this probability here, right? So it's the inverse of the, the, cumulative, distribu of the cumulative distribution function, right? So this is the example with a normal zero one, but of course you could, you could play with this now with any normal distribution, right? With any mean or any standard deviation. It's a very useful tool for understanding the probabilities under the curve. So here's an example of a normal distribution with mean 500 and standard deviation 100. 500 is the midpoint here, so this is where the maximum is, and the spread of this distribution is, is determined by the standard deviation. If I made this 1000, then this standard deviation would become much broader, and the x-axis range would go out much further to cover you know, the 95% of the area under the curve between this range and this range, right? So the standard deviation determines the spread and the mean determines the center point of this distribution. And it's a symmetric distribution. The normal distribution is symmetric, okay? 
here's what a CDF looks like in the continuous space. I showed you the CDF in the discrete case, I think in the binomial earlier. In the continuous case, we've got continuous values on the x-axis and the probability is rising up to one. You see that? The maximum value is one. So this is the cumulative probability of observing some number like this or something less than that. So of course you could go off all the way to infinity. This thing is going to asymptote at one. It's never gonna change now, right? So th that's what a CDF looks like for the normal distribution, right? Now the inverse of the CDF, right, just flips the axes on this function. So this becomes the x-axis and this becomes the y-axis, right? So this is the inverse. Here I plug in a probability and I get back the quantile, you know, from the cumulative distribution function for that particular probability. So that's basically the, the setup here. These are the important functions of the normal distribution. And one important thing I want to point out is that any other distribution that we'll be using in this course or in the textbook later on in the further chapters, in the later chapters of the book, we will always be working with these types of functions in order to understand that distribution, right? And we will always be wanting to understand the properties of a particular distribution that we are working with, right? And these kinds of the DPQR family of functions is extremely useful for helping us to understand what the distribution looks like and what the probabilities are for particular ranges of values, right? This will become extremely important in Bayesian data analysis, in particular when we are trying to derive prior distributions by thinking about what the plausible values might be. Okay, so of course I will talk about that later. But this is the preparation we need for doing all this uh, Bayesian modeling later on, right? So what have we done so far? We looked at random variables, uh, especially the, uh, the discrete and random uh, cases with uh, examples of each, right? At least two examples from the PM, from the discrete case and one from the continuous case. You will see more examples of other distributions later on, of course, but these are the canonical examples that you can use to generalize, you know, to other distributions. Because the story is not, never gonna change now. All that, was change, all that will change is the f of x, right? That's what will change now, right? And you should be very clear about this, the use of the DPQR family of functions because you will always need them whenever you're thinking about a particular distribution. Okay, so that's it about the normal distribution. Next, I'm going to talk about maximum likelihood estimation.